Well, can you believe it? Another Miller and Crystal. This time it's the MX125. Haven't even powered it up yet. Just getting it up here on the bench to take a peek see at it. See if I see anything going on with this just off the top of my head and well, from what I can see, everything looks good at the moment. Let's hook a voltmeter up to it and make sure we don't have a DC offset on the speaker first. I don't want to blow up one of my little chintzy Infinity 6-inch speakers because this thing could definitely do it. Okay, voltmeter is connected to the speaker lead. Let's go ahead and power this thing up and see what happens. And I did see a little over a volt. And I am seeing a little bit of oscillation going on right there. But nothing to be concerned about. We'll turn the power off. And I will connect an actual speaker to it and see what happens. Okay, speaker is connected. Let's power it up again. And I'm hearing some hum. And I'm seeing the current go up and down. And the speaker is oscillating slightly. So I think need to find out why we have a hum. And I can tell you right off the bat, the base level pot definitely needs to be cleaned. That's not good. Yeah, shouldn't be getting a hum whatsoever out of this thing. So at this point, I'm suspecting probably a bad filter cap and needing to clean the crossover frequency pot and the base level pots. So let's go ahead and get the board detached from the heat sink and do some tests and check all the caps as I usually do. And usually I just do a cap refresh on these things because they are getting to be 20 plus, sometimes 30 years old. Okay, I've got all the capacitors marked with little red lines. These are all hundreds. There, 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 and there. These are tens and there, and this is a one. So let's go ahead and check all these caps. So we'll start with the main filter caps, which I have marked right here that I did not mention. These are 10,000 microfarads, 63 volts. I'd like to see 0 0.01 or less. And that one tests absolutely perfect. Teetering between 00, 0 and 0, 01. This is the other 10,000. Absolutely perfect. That's really what I want to see. These are 10s. Anything less than an ohm I'd be totally happy with. And I've got 0 0.09, 0 0.1 ohms. Perfectly fine. And 0 0.06, 0 0.05, great. This is a 100, 0.2. I'm very good with 0.2. Over here on this side, another 100. 0.21, I'm very good with that. Another 100, 0.21, very good with that. This is the one microfarad cap, so anything below about 5 ohms I'm happy with. And it tests 3.5. And now the two, these are power supply regulating capacitors for the 12 volt line. 0.58, just a tiny bit high, but not terrible. And for a minute, I thought it was 0.26. It's actually 26, 27 ohms. That one is definitely bad. Make sure I'm just not seeing things. Yes, I see the decimal point on that one. And I do not see a decimal point on that one. So I think I'm definitely going to recommend a complete capacitor replacement. With the exception of the main filter caps, they test absolutely perfect. I don't think we need to do anything with those. So I think I'll go ahead and just replace all the caps, clean the pots, and I bet this thing is restored to like new condition once again. Now I do see a little bit of heat right here on these resistors. Now they are responsible for dropping the about 55 volts down to 12 volts and then they actually use a couple of zener diodes which maybe i can show you over here there's a zener right there and there is a zener right there 
to clamp the voltage at the 12 volts, I believe 12, it might be 15, that these op amps need to have to do their job correctly. So it has a plus and a minus 12 volt rail to serve these TLO64 op amps. So let's get started and replace a bunch of capacitors on this thing. All right, so I've got all the negative leads marked on all the capacitors, except the main filter caps that test absolutely perfect. We're gonna leave those in there, no problem. So let's go ahead and get those zipped off the board and get the new ones installed. Clean the pots, and I'm sure this thing is gonna be good as new. And we'll go ahead and add some RTV to the big resistors so they don't wobble around because once again, they added nothing and I just don't want to see them break loose over time. So normally I'd go ahead and resolder this Molex connector, but it looks like it was hand soldered at the factory, so I'm not even gonna touch that. But I did go ahead and resolder the dropping resistors right here and right here, just because they've been running hot and I wanna make sure they have a good connection to the circuit board. Now, because they have been running hot, they did bake some of the conformal coating off the board, but I think it's all gonna be okay in the end. So if you notice the date right here, January 16th, 1996, I decided since this thing was 26 years old and these don't have a standby circuit, these capacitors have been in use, powered on the entire time. That's why I decided just to go ahead and recap all the small caps in the board. Now had one of the large caps tested bad, maybe above 0 0.02 ohms, I would have recommended replacing those, but because they all tested perfect, I'm just gonna let those slide. Because we did have one of the five 100 microfarad caps that tested in the 20 ohm range, I opted to change them all. And while I'm there, I'm just gonna change every other small cap on the board just to be safe. Many more years of use for this customer with no comebacks that way. So let's go ahead and put this part back together and then we'll go ahead and shoot some deoxid F5, the fader control, not the D5 that's made for contact switches but the F5 that's made for carbon-based potentiometers. Now, some of these models had a heat sink that was not removable. In addition to the four screw holes that you see right here on the heat sink, there were a couple of stationary screws that held the heat sink in place. Now, this one is removable, which means when I pull these two screws out and these two that are still out, the heat sink falls off, make sure you don't lose the thermal transfer pad right here. So I've already got the screws through the STK chip and I don't know if you can see it down in here. 
It's kind of hard to see, but there are some fiber washers you want to make sure you get in between the circuit board and the STK chip. There's another thermal pad between the aluminum chassis and the STK chip. So if you have this apart, make sure that you get the screw, the lock washer, the flat washer, the fiber washer, the circuit board, the second fiber washer, the STK chip, the first thermal pad, the aluminum chassis, and then there you can see the screw sticking through right there. Make sure you have the second thermal pad on the heat sink and then the heat sink itself. So I'm going to go ahead and just very carefully basically line this up and then drop this into place and attach those two screws that hold the STK chip down. And then I'll attach these two screws over here on this side. Don't forget the screws on this side have an aluminum standoff that needs to go in between the circuit board and the aluminum chassis. Okay, all the small caps have been changed. Both pots have been cleaned and I just need to apply some silicone RTV to the large components, the big resistors on this board, as well as around the little caps I changed just to make sure they don't vibrate loose in the future. As you can see, Miller and Kressel did add some, looks like hot glue around these capacitors right here and it has broken free over time. So it does allow these to move. I will add some RTV around those because that is a very good bond. So next I'm gonna go ahead and retention the Molex pins, as you've seen me do before. You'll see me do it again many more times, I am sure. And then I think we'll go ahead and measure the drop across these resistors right here. Now they are 1K resistors on these two dropping resistors. There's that one and this one. Those are 1K resistors. Now these four are the emitter resistors and of course they have them all back to back. They're very low value. They're like 0.22 ohms, something like that. So I want to measure the voltage drop between the fuse right here and the output of the Zener diode. So that's going to effectively tell me the voltage drop across this resistor. And we can do a quick calculation to determine how many watts this resistor is actually dissipating. I'm just going to guess it's a five watt resistor. It's probably going to be less than two watts of total dissipation. So let's go ahead and retention the Molex connector. We'll do those tests and we'll fire this thing up and hopefully we get great results. Okay. Remember if they're not perfectly round, don't even worry about it. They will push out when you plug it back together. All those have been compressed a little bit to add a bit of pretension to them. Next, we just have the one male pin on this side and we'll do the female pin on the circuit board. So basically just a little fine needle nose plier. This is a very fine tip. These are Weller Exolytes. And I think the part number is an L4G. So I'm just gonna give this thing a bit of pretension. I'm sure I'm gonna be in the way the entire time. So you can't really see what I'm doing. But there you can see it's definitely a little bit smaller. It's going to add great pretension when we plug these things back together. Okay, so let's figure out how many watts these resistors are actually dissipating. So I have the power on. I'm at 125 volts AC input and I see a positive 58 volts on that fuse. And then over here, I have a negative 58 volts. So going out of this resistor right now into the Zener diode, so I have exactly 12 volts, and that should be on the cathode side of this Zener diode. And yes, 11.97. A 
Coming out of this resistor, I have negative 12.06, which should actually be on the anode side of this zener, negative 12.05. It is fluctuating very slightly, 1204, 1205, not enough to be worried about, 1 one hundredth of a volt, 12.00 and 12.00. So knowing that we have 58 volts going in and 12 volts coming out, we can do some simple math to figure out how many watts each resistor is actually dissipating at 125 volts AC input. So I'll see if I can do this without getting too much light in the phone here. So it's pretty simple. You take the voltage, which is 58 volts, and subtract 12 volts. So that's 46 volts. So take 46 times 46, that's 2116, and divide it by the resistance in ohms, which is 1000 ohms, and I see 2.116 watts dissipated. That's pretty close to what I thought it was going to be. So just to make sure, let's go to an electrical calculator right here, Ohm's Law. So I've already got 46 plugged into it right there. 1,000 ohms, we're actually drawing 46 milliamps, and the power is 2.116 watts. So there it is, V squared divided by R. So the voltage times the voltage divided by the resistance, which is 1,000 ohms. And there it is, 2.116 watts. And now those are five watt resistors, so they're operating well within their tolerance of five watts. They're op operating at less than 50%, which is perfectly ideal for a unit like this that basically operates 24 seven. Like I said, these do not have a standby transformer. They are always on anytime the thing is plugged in. Okay, I'm pretty happy with the amount of RTV applied. Didn't go all the way around this time, but I did secure it on at least two sides and three sides on the large filter caps down here, just to keep them stable. So let's go ahead and fold the RF shield back in place, fire this thing up and see what we get. So I know people are gonna comment once again that I shouldn't use this GE clear silicone for this type of use. But one of the reasons I use this, let me see if I can get a focus on this thing, minus 60 to up to 400 degrees. I've actually used this to repair high voltage circuits in color TV receivers back in the 80s, same exact stuff. It's worked excellent. And that was with 25,000 to 30,000 volts when I had a Corona or maybe a small carbon track and I wasn't completely confident, I couldn't get the replacement parts economically, I used this to actually insulate the high voltage and it worked perfectly, years and years. I actually talked to a customer, I repaired an old Sears set that was made back in the mid 70s. I used this because it was arcing. I cleaned up the carbon path as best I could and then I sealed it with this RTV he contacted me, actually I came across him years later, probably 20 years later. He said that set lasted another 15 plus years before it finally died of another unrelated problem. So yeah, this stuff is excellent. Now I know people are going to say I should be using the $35 per ounce silicone. Well, this is 2.8 ounces and it costs like $8 for a single tube, 2.8 ounces. I've had extremely good luck with it. My philosophy is if it works and you're happy with it, just keep doing it. All right, let's put this thing together and fire it up.
Okay, all back together. MP3 player is connected. Let's power this thing on. And I do hear something. No hum. As I turn the pots up and down. Everything sounds good. Now the speakers are distorting. It's actually shaking the video lights. So I've determined that I need to get some better speakers in here to test subwoofers. Now I do have a couple of vintage Radio Shack Mach 1s and Mach 2s. The Mach 1s that I have actually are the rubber surround version that never deteriorate. The Mach 2s had the foam surround and I did replace them with a couple of MTX car 15 inch speakers. So maybe I'll put those in here, use those to test subwoofers with. But nevertheless, It's working perfectly. So let's go ahead and kill the MP3 player. Remember last time we had a bunch of hum? I hear nothing right now, regardless of where I put these things. No distortion anywhere. But I think that's gonna be it. A complete recap, with the exception of the large filter caps, Retention the Molex connector, clean the pots, secure all the capacitors with the silicone RTV. I certainly hope you enjoyed this video. Go ahead and leave me a question, a comment, a concern down below, good or bad, whether it be on a technique that I used, the RTV, anything you like, go ahead and leave me a comment. I try to respond to the comments when I have time. While you're down there, if you could, please hit that subscribe button. It really does help my channel grow. You can follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at NorCal715. You can email me NorCal715videos at gmail.com. That is the best way to contact me. Please be patient. I have a full-time job and I do these repairs in my spare time. If you message me on social media, please be aware. It might be weeks or even months before I get back to you. I rarely check those. Please, if you want to contact me, use the Gmail address. Remember, with your help, we can try to keep these things out of the landfill, out of the recycle bin, and out of the e-waste facility. Everyone have a good day. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Bye-bye.